Previously on the Trogley's Guitar Show, Chicago Music Exchange wants to buy my 62 Ebony Block SG in cash. I suggested, how about you throw that guitar in too? Welcome back Troglodytes to your Daily Dose Guitar Information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. This is a unique Gibson prototype, but it's one of them weird super strat things. This is known as the Gibson Victory Series MV2. There were two different models within the series. The MV2 just had two humbuckers, whereas the MV10 had three pickups in it. However, that single coil is not actually a single coil. It's a stacked one, so it's technically an HHH. Now, I've actually already documented a regular version one of these that has like all the fine nitty gritty details. So if you want to learn about that, check that episode out. This is a redocumentation simply because it's actually a marked prototype for this series. Gibson original prototype number 10. This one's been passed around a couple of times in the past year or so. I was surprised this guitar sat in their shop as long as it did. I'd actually tried to buy it before, but we were just a little bit too far apart price-wise. But it just made sense for them to not have to pay as much for that SG. And now I have a cool story behind this one of how I got it. A way to remember that ebony block buy. But as far as prototypes go, it seems kind of lame on the surface because being a late prototype, it's very similar to a production level one, which I already have in my collection. I mean, looking at our neck pickup, you've got the bottom one that has the adjustable coils. Same is true on production. Look at our bridge pickup, no adjustable coils. Same is true over here. I mean, we'll have to tear it apart and look at the insides to see if anything's different. But the body still appears to be a hard rock maple. Colors very similar, just vaguely different. Still appears to be three piece maple necks on both of them. As far as our headstock, this one just says Gibson Victory, whereas this one says Gibson Victory. Victory CM. Now, many of the early ones actually are branded CM. That's not necessarily special just to the prototypes. What does it mean in relation to the Victory series? Nobody exactly knows. Some people have hypothesized it means ceramic magnet. Some people think it meant chick magnet, which is kind of true for a later 2015-ish model, even though there's a story that claims it means chucker mod. Some people have also hypothesized it's Roman numerals for 900 and that's how many they plan to make. I don't 100% for sure know, but I think it might actually be Chick Magnet. Whatever it is, it can't be that important to it because that branding was later dropped. So far, there's only one thing that I noticed that's different and I found it straight after pulling it out of the case. This might have a prototype posi-lock strap button on it because look at how much shorter it is than usual. Here's what our normal one looks like. It's just a little bit taller. In fact, I thought maybe this got sank into the guitar <laughs> during shipping. That's how low profile that is. Other than that, it just looks like the decals they were using were all connected and of lesser quality in the prototype run because the production ones don't have that ugly outline around them. But these were Gibson's first take on kind of a super strat guitar. Like they're not super, super stratty because you don't have like the tremolo systems on them, but they were one of the early models to feature the top adjust bridge. But it was Gibson getting their foot in the door for these strat style guitars. And then eventually we get like the US1, U2 that take it a step further. But the Victory series bodies were later used on the Q slash Alpha series guitars and basses as well. But there's also a Victory bass out there. And these were designed by Chuck Burge and Tim Shaw did the electronics for these, which are rather unique. We'll talk about that on the workbench segment, though. But this is not the correct case for this one. You can actually follow somebody's journey of owning this guitar for a little bit through Reddit forums. He had found this separately. I think it might actually be a U2 slash US1 case. Most production ones just have a black rectangular case. Another case that you'll sometimes find is the Gibson Guitar Company one. Generally, you find these with the Sonics, but they do fit in them. If you really want a case from that period that would fit the guitar and you're in a bind. I know it looks like you got tons of space, but the headstock's so big on these things, it definitely secures it. But inside our case, we do have some interesting paperwork. So here's the MV10. It tells you all about the specs on here. Now this is what I'm most interested in because look at that headstock on the MV2. It just says Gibson. Same thing over here. So that makes me think most of the prototype stages of these were just them toying around with what the headstock should actually look like. So I'm glad I got this into document because now I realize what's going on here. But to learn more about prototype number 10 of the MV2 series, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench, take an individual look at its parts and specs, and see what else we can find out about it. Okay. 
After a deep cleaning, this one looks a little bit less player's grade, but don't be fooled. It still has a lot of impressions, scratches, nicks and dings. This was somebody's player. It wasn't kept as a collection piece. But I am happy to announce I found a lot of differences while cleaning this, but let's talk about our electronics first. You're going to notice it's routed for an HSH setup. That is true on the production models as well. Any MV2 will have the routing if you wish to convert it into MV10 specs. But the routing looks pretty clean, but uh-oh, the ground wire was not attached when I opened this, so I'll have to fix that. But we were talking about the color differences. If you look underneath where the pickguard has shielded, you can tell the finish actually started life just a little bit darker than it looks like right now, so the sun has faded this over the years. But now let's talk about the pickups. So the neck is officially known as the Velvet Brick, whereas the bridge in the MV2 is called the Magna 2. I'm not really looking to tear these apart to see if they're different from a regular, but the MVX and MV2 series utilize different pickups. So they might just look like, hey, one has the added middle and the other one doesn't have it, but no, the pickups are completely different. The MV2 was primarily for the discerning country player, whereas the MV10 was like a all around. But since we don't have a traditional serial number, there's no way to date this guitar outside of pot codes. And I was shocked. This pot dates to 1978 and this one to mid-1977. I gotta remember, this is within the brand new research and development production studio, so it's possible they were just using old parts, but it seems maybe they were experimenting with these as early as 79. These didn't really come out till 1981, so I guess it kind of makes sense. So in many ways, this might be one of the few produced 70s examples of this particular guitar. But being a prototype, things have been messed with. They probably changed it a few times. Somebody else might have been in here. I mean, this cap doesn't look vintage correct to me. If you follow a previous owner's tale of this, you had to change the mini toggle because it wasn't working. Well, that explains why it's a cylindrical shape rather than the flathead style that you normally find in this era. But by this point in the prototype staging, they knew they wanted to do the whole zebra and reverse zebra bobbins. And they still had the correct knobs on them. The kind of top hat in style. But I'm really glad I had a regular MV2 to compare this to. Otherwise, I would have never noticed pretty much every contour on the body has been changed. So that brought this from a... Meh, kind of a boring prototype to, whoa, nice. So I want you to pay extra close attention here. You see how nice and rounded over it is right here in the cutaway? You can see the same thing over here where you're playing. It's all rounded over. It is not blocky and chunky. Come on over to the production side of things and you can see there's a hard rigid line right there before the contouring begins. So here's production and here's prototype. Next, watch closely at the edge right over here. It's very sculpted and rounded throughout the entire body until you get right up to that horn. On the production, it doesn't really start until about midway through the body, and there's kind of a hard rigid line before you just vaguely get any type of a cut. This one seems a lot clunkier. Whereas this is very rounded, you know, kind of like a P-Base, because that's what these were designed off of that you can read about in interviews. This is a very nice design. Next, check out this cutaway again. Very rounded over, almost PRS-like. But production, you only have like a semi-scoop on the side. There's a hard line all the way up to the body right there before any type of sculpting ever occurs. That's more for aesthetics, I think. Whereas the initial design definitely aid in play. But now take a second to appreciate it from the edge. So you got the rounded cutaways over here, but then you also have a comfort cut on the back. You see how smooth and transition this one is? This was a handcrafted body. As you come over to the one, you see how hard the lines are? I've never liked that about these. And to know that they had it right in the prototype stages and somehow messed it up somewhere along the way makes me very sad. I'll let you see this one more time. You can just barely even see the contour lines. It's all very soft. I mean, even the line just on the top for these things are, is very hard. They didn't contour it enough. I would argue the cream layers and the pick guard were a little bit thicker as compared to the production ones, but that might just vary example to example. But just look at the size of the horn right here. I think the one was slimmed a little bit. Here's the prototype other side versus production. So this is all of a sudden a really cool prototype to own. But now let's check out our bridge and tailpiece system. So this is known as a top adjust bridge. Why is it called top adjust? Because you adjust your saddles from the top for some reason. You can find these with both brass and nylon saddles. This one happens to be nylon. 
You could buy these separately if you wanted them for your guitar. Now there's the original marketing for it. But there was a different side adjust one that still had the gimmick that we'll talk about here. That one was called the 3.2 pneumatic bridge. They're very similar bridges outside of how you adjust your saddles because they have three holes on each side that would allow you to essentially move your bridge because when you have a thick stud like this, if your intonation's off and you can't get it properly intonated with your saddles without running out of room, you can just take it from your regular position and move it up or have it slanted. There's like nine different positions that you could do from lower, lower, middle, middle, upper, upper, to slanted and all the different ways. Very shortly lived, just a few years they toyed around with that. This is one of the more iconic models to use it outside of select Les Paul Customs. As far as your tailpiece, Looks like your regular stuff here. But now let's take a look at that posi lock. This was another very new thing at this time. There's a bit of a cult following of these now due to Adam Jones. But they were indeed called posi locks. They are basically a version of a strap lock before our more advanced systems of today. They have the diamond portion to help grip your strap better. But I really do think this one might be a prototype. Because again, look how flat it is. It almost looks like it just kind of sank through. However, it's flanged at the top, so I don't think that's the case that this was just damaged. If it were a damaged original, you would think that there would also be like some impression into the body. Because usually big drops that would do something like that sinks the strap button into it. But I did not see any damage to the wood. So that's another reason why I think that could be a prototype piece. Here it is directly compared to what you normally find on a posi lock. See how much shorter it is? I think it had something to do with securing your strap even more and they just decided to ditch that because then they would become position specific and that would get annoying. But the reason why I thought the screw was changed earlier is because that ridge makes it stick up a little bit farther than usual. Normally the screw sinks into it. So I'd be curious if any of these other prototypes of this model happen to have that or if anybody's seen this before. I'm really happy I decided to pick this one up and just happened to have an MV2 production to compare it to today because I think now people appreciate this one a little bit more than before. Just a little bit. <laughs> I know if I wanted to play one, I would definitely choose this. It feels a lot lighter in weight too and the sculpted edges just doesn't feel as blocky. But here's another thing you might enjoy about the multi-voice series. They do not have the standard fret wire of the era. So Norlin Gibson is known for their low wide frets, which makes huge bends be a little bit more difficult as compared to modern fret wire. But this has a very skinny tall wire on it. So if you're used to modern guitars, this might be a good transitional piece for you. But they have these interesting side mother of pearl dots and then you get the double at the 12th but it still has that Gibson 24 3 quarter inch scale with a 12 inch fretboard radius. And I measure 1.67 inches at the nut, increasing to two by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.82 and 0.97 by the 12th. It starts off rather thin, but then does get a little bit more rounded as you go up. You can see that here on the contour gauge, just a nice rounded C shape. However, what's unique is if you compare it to a regular production one, it seems the neck is a little bit fuller and wider feeling in its roundedness. Cause I took the measurements and it was still two inches by the 12th. The neck shape was very different. So not only were they toying around with decals and how the headstock should look, they were fine tuning the body, what they could actually produce at production level, cost versus quality, as well as what neck profile these things should have. But now we can move on to our headstock. This cleaned up beautifully. Helps show off the outline of the decal that they were using. I just think that's hilarious. They were really that inspired by fender bases that they wanted to use their decals and then eventually decided against it. I think they made the right move in the long run not doing it like that. But our truss rod looks good on this one. You can see our maple neck. You've got your witch's nose truss rod cover here reading MV2. But here we are all strung back up. It wouldn't surprise me if a CME tech did fix that ground wire because I did it once and I tugged it and I thought, oh yeah, that's pretty good. But the ground wire in there is like spring loaded because it's bent and it just doesn't bend back normally. So first time I fixed it, got it in there, I thought, okay, yeah, that's good. But then this screw's all stripped out and I put another block of wood in there thinking, oh yeah, that's gonna fix it, but it didn't, it just fell in. So I took it off again and then, oh yeah, my, my ground wire fell off. So I fixed it, came off again. Third time, hopefully that's the charm. So if somebody ever buys this in the distant future and the ground wire has come undone again, I'm sorry, I did try. Also, this screw is much longer than all the other ones, so it's likely been replaced. But I just found out I accidentally left some solder blobs in the guitar, so I had to take it apart again, 
get those out. And then I thought, you know what? I might as well move that longer screw over here because that's going to work much better. So now screws aren't falling out. But we forgot to talk about the toggle switch. So the MV2 has a three-way switch. Whereas the MVX has a five way because you need it. And as far as our readings within the circuit, the bridge reads 9.64 K ohms in split 511, neck position 7.75 in full mode split 3.97, then the middle position 4.76 and split at 2.48. But we also forgot to talk about this. You actually have tilt on these pickups, just like the Gibson Sonics. That was something new they were trying, never really took off but you can tilt the pickup like this utilizing two springs. But the other side is just one. But now we can move on to the back. I've always loved the bodies of these. The Eastern Hard Rock Maple that they were using just has some cool wood grain. You can see this on the E2 CMT guitars as well. But it looks so shiny and clean, right? Well, until you get into the harsh lighting. I mean, you can see, once again, this thing was played. It's got nicks, dings, and scratches. If it wasn't for it being a prototype, this would not be a collectible guitar. Now to me, the prototype's cutaway seems to be just a little bit deeper. Like this one's a bit more shallow in its cut, whereas this one's rounded over. As far as the roundedness of the corners of the body, yeah, it looks like it was even a little bit more rounded on the prototype. I would bet that came down to cost savings features. They didn't have to do as much hand sanding to get all the softer edges. But look at the heel of the neck. It's very traditional looking on the production model. However, it's more D-shaped on the prototype, so that's something else that changed. That's a very drastic different look. And then this is the production's output jack plate. However, the prototype's actually rectangular rather than square. I did take it off just in case somebody had like replaced it at one point in time, but no, there's no other holes underneath there. And now we can move up the backside of the neck, just like the rest of the guitar. And there's some light nicks and dings. We've got some dings over here too, but thankfully no brakes, cracks, or repairs. But there's our cool original Gibson prototype stamp. I just love the way that looked in the 80s. They've got that whole dog bone style to it. Now, sometimes in this era, you'll also find a decal of the same but usually that's later 80s but this is the first model i've seen that had like a number so there was many of these prototypes out there i feel like a couple years ago i remember seeing a few other ones but this is the only one that pops up on google searches anymore but here we can see gibson branded Schaller tuners but in a last ditch effort to find anything new let's do a black light test well you can see the nicks and dings a little bit more clearly but no hidden black light signatures or anything it's always fun on prototypes when you find like a signature of the employee or something in it, but so far nothing like that. Here you can see the delaminating logo as we were talking about earlier. And looking at the back, does not appear to be any type of finish touch-ups or major wear slash rubbing to the finish. But hey, we do have some stand rash on the neck. You just can't see that because it's a dark finish and kind of reddish in hue and that's usually the color of those. But not even finish wear on the neck. We're looking good here, outside of the very top part that was rubbed through. But all said and done, how much does this one weigh? Eight pounds, 14.2 ounces, so just a hair under nine. That's not too bad. My production one actually weighs less, but feels heavier because a lot of times these will be imbalanced. Where the body is so much heavier than the neck, it makes it feel heavier. All right, let's go ahead, plug our prototype in and hear how it sounds. say I really love that velvet brick humbucker. Rather punching and it pairs well with that bridge pickup too. However the bridge pickup is a little bit thinner.
we'll switch it into the coil split mode. <laughs> Once again, I find myself preferring the Velvet Brick Neck Humbucker, but the bridge pickup has its own certain quirky tones. It just sounds much thinner, even though it's much closer to the strings than the neck. Now we'll try a little bit of dirt in humbucking mode. <laughs> Now I like the bridge pickup. It's very compressed sounding, not overly bitey. about this prototype victory guitar, what are my final thoughts? Super glad I purchased this in order to take a look. I just thought, yeah, maybe there's not much different to it. This was like the last prototype or something before production, but we found a lot of things vastly different, mainly the contours of the body and perhaps even a prototype posi lock button, which is really cool. But we've actually seen Cesar teasing one of these in like prototype stages in a modern day. It has an Explorer headstock. He had some pretty cool V style inlays. So will we see a reissue of the Gibson Victory multi-voice series guitars? And then will they become popular the second time? I don't know. But until then, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at this very unique prototype number 10. As far as the fate of this one, yeah, I'm keeping it in my collection because I think it's just fun and it's got a cool story. And if I'm not keeping the Ebony Block SG, at least I have a story behind it now with this weird thing from the 80s. Now, as far as the tones, I was actually really surprised. I haven't tried one of these in a few years, but this particular one sounded fantastic. The neck pickup definitely steals the show. So I don't think it's the same as what they used in the Sonics because it just had a similar name. But the bridge pickup surprised me on the dirty tones. So very untraditional shape, but you might try one. You might find you enjoy it. Now, the prototype's not for sale, but I could potentially be convinced to let this one go because I don't really need more than one. But at the same time, it's nice to have this in my collection to show off the differences in the contours of the body. But in the case of a museum display, I don't think anybody's really going to get to appreciate that as much as they did in this video. So feel free to reach out if you need one. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.